just tried to record it and all my text had vanished. In fact, it had all just turned to black text on a black background. So even us wonderful lecturers cock up now and then. Now, I've been struggling with this one, mainly because I've been desperately trying to make bricks interesting. And I've also been trying to make them a little sexy. But I don't think I can manage to make bricks sexy. Um, I hope most of you have actually picked up and fondled a brick before. You know how heavy they are and what they feel like. So let's fire in because they're a very fundamental um, uh, material for construction. They've been used for rather a long time. So here we go. You know, down here there's a few snapshots of bricks. These darker ones are called engineering bricks. This is a fairly standard, standard class one brick, first class brick. A little bit softer brick there. There's the standard dimensions of a brick. So basically, if you know what a brick is, and you know that the joint, the mortar joint, is normally 10 mil, you can actually count the bricks on a building and calculate roughly the size and height of a building just by counting bricks. Um, these ones here, are uh, I know these as red rubbers. Um, yeah, I know you're all chuckling, but they're very, very soft bricks which can actually be carved. Um, you can find those quite often. So, a brick, well, it's just a building element. It's um, Nowadays is a standard dimension, although some very old ones are, tend to be much thinner and variable. Um, they're lightweight, easy to lift, easy to easy to design with, um, it's just a structural unit that's rectangular. Uh, when I say design with, when you're designing, say just take a house, when you're designing a house, your positioning of, of openings in the wall, the windows and the doors, you don't chuck them anywhere. You put them roughly where you think they are, and then say from the corner of the building, measuring, in, measuring to the first side of a window or a door frame, you need to check that that measurement is actually achievable with bricks. Now, the, the, the smallest part of a brick we use is half a brick. So, therefore, you would work out how many whole bricks and a half brick, including the mortar joint, you need. It is between the corner and your window or door frame, and then you just adjust that measurement to fit. So, it's actually buildable easily, okay? Because a builder would do that on site anyway, and then it won't be quite what you want. Um, they're made from clay. And they can be either sun-dried, which is the traditional way of doing it, where they're just laid out on the ground and fired. That apparently still happens in a lot of countries, especially India does them, and it, it still produces a reasonable brick. Uh, not a high-strength brick, but enough for maybe going one or possibly two floors high without the bricks beginning to crush under their own weight. Uh, or, as we do it nowadays, in a kiln, uh, just like we do pottery and stuff. You shove them in and you heat them up to a high temperature and that actually creates a much denser, stronger brick. Um, if you really heat them up for a long time and to a high temperature, you tend to get an engineering brick, which is almost moisture impervious. It can be used as a damp proof course. Uh, Victorians like using them for that. Uh, and they're extremely strong. Uh, we'll talk about strength in a little while. Um, that's that you really, you can use bricks to be load-bearing, which is what we all think about, but mostly today, on commercial buildings, they're decorative. So they're not actually a whole brick, they're just a, a thin veneered brick which is glued on or hung on to a facade. Um, there are examples of buildings still built today which are load-bearing. I'll show you a couple of those towards the end. And just so you get a feeling for this, um, bricks date back at least 7,000 7, years, at least 7,000 years. They just would have been uh, clay, clay mixed in with a bit of a bit of maybe animal dung and some straw to reinforce them, and then just left out to bake in the sun. Uh, the materials that we actually use for them, well, we got good ones and we got bad ones. Um, alumina. That's basically what clay is made of. Alumina. Um, a brick normally has twenty to thirty percent of it. Um, doesn't vary much beyond that um, and it basically lets the clay because the clay is the rest of it aluminum's in the clay it just makes the clay a bit malleable you can mold it a bit slippery a bit plastic uh, without the aluminum in it you it just wouldn't stick together uh, then you have a bit of silica uh, again naturally in clay but we can add extra 
which is sand, uh, it's mixed with the clay, um, and in its composition with alumina, it provides more workability. Um, preferably, we want about 50 to 60 percent of uh, sand, and as you would know, you know, sand is just tiny, tiny crushed up stone or rock, and so obviously it's quite strong. Um, you don't think of sand as strong, really, because it runs through your fingers and toes, but it, it is when you mould it into something. Uh, lime, a little quantity, not a lot, but a little quantity of lime, no more than 5%, um, is recommended to be added, because that controls the shrinkage of the bricks when they're waiting to be fired. Uh, important for sun-dried ones, obviously. Uh, a little bit of lime be added. Uh, iron oxide, normally around 5% or so, um, it acts with the lime to stick the sand together and, and it creates and stick the whole brick together really, the iron oxide. And it also gives the familiar red colour of the brick. Um, the different red colours, the darker the red, that means the higher the temperature's been when it was actually put in the kiln. So uh, darker red brick may be a bit stronger. Maybe not, but could be. There's some bad stuff. Don't put too much lime in. You end up with a brick with no strength. Uh, iron pyrites. Um, if, you, if that's in the brick, then when it's fired in the kiln, it basically just crumbles. Um, so it's not a good one. Uh, alkalis, you can get that from potash or from soda, which sometimes can contaminate your mixture. Um, if you do that, then the bricks will actually stick together. They'll fuse together in the um, kiln if they're touching, but they'll generally they'll just twist, warp and come out of a stupid shape you can't use. Uh, pebbles. Now, we want pebbles called aggregate in concrete, but we don't want it in bricks. Uh, they'll stop the clay being um, an almost solid, homogenous block. So there'll be weak points and porous points in the bricks. Uh, and you don't want any vegetation or organic matter, even though I did say they did use animal poo and, and, and straw. Traditionally, that's for the sunburnt ones. Um, a little bit, a tiny little bit of contamination of this in a brick material can help it burn. Um, but if it's not completely burnt, I there's too much of it in there or the temperature wasn't high enough, then you get a very porous brick. Because as that vegetation and organic matter gets hot, it lets off gas and the bubbles are trapped in the brick. And you end up with, um, <laughs> it could end up with almost honeycomb I suppose. Or crunchy, I like crunchies. Um, Manufacturing, well the best way to talk about manufacturing is really just looking at the flow chart here. So you dig your clay and your sand and your constituent out of the ground. You store that, you know, just chuck it somewhere, store it. Then when you get delivery of it, it gets rolled and crushed and produced to, to actually produce it into a, almost a powder, a fine, a fine grain or powder. Then you screen it, put it through sieves to get rid of the larger bits and pieces because you, you want it to be a standard size, homogenous. Um, then you'll actually add water, mix it, add water. It gets extruded as a continuous snake of clay and the machine chops it up into little individual bricks. So once they've been formed, mixed up and they've been cut, which could all be done by hand as well, you come down here you can put finishes on them, so when you get different, you can get a colour, you can make glazed bricks, um, you can put a sandy finish on them, you can have a different types of cut. That's put on there before they're still, we call them raw. Then they're stored so they naturally dry, because you, you want to get rid of as much moisture as you can, because you don't want steam and therefore bubbles developing when they fire. So when these have been dried, they then go into the fire, a giant kiln, raised to a set temperature, which depends on the strength of brick you're trying to um, manufacture, and then they're taken out and they're allowed to cool naturally, and then they're packaged up, here you go, packaged up, they leave little holes in so the forklift can pick them up. And notice they're not covered, this one isn't covered with plastic, and then they're shipped to site. Now the thing being, when they get to site, you don't want to leave them on the site and get wet in the rain or you don't want them sitting on a wet surface to suck up water because that will start to cause efflorescence 
Um, they get damp and the natural salts in the brick will then evaporate through the surface as that white or grey staining. We'll talk about that a little bit more later on. So they need to be stored off the ground and preferably under cover. Um, that's the easiest way to do that. There's not much more to do about this. I don't know why I've got a topic there because I don't think I actually... Oh, I did, yeah, look. So here is a man, probably in India or somewhere, and he's hand-making bricks. So there's his mould. This this is obviously gone black instead of white, so that's the mould there, the mould, the base. He's done all these. You can see these ones are changing colour as they're sitting in the sun. That's the mixture. And he's just making thousands and thousands of bricks. And they'll be quite usable. They won't have the strength we're used to, but... So there's your manufacturer. Now, we keep talking about strength. Okay, so normal bricks have a classification. And it's based on their average compressive strength. Here's the equipment. Big press and that bit's there. So squash and wait until it actually fractures and starts to fall apart. Okay, so you get different ones of those. Um, there's an Australian standard about the classification of clay bricks. So you can look at that one or quote that in a, an assignment if you need to. And this is just uh, from the product information of one brick. They're all the same brick. They've just got different finishes and names. Uh, as you can see, they're the same. Different colours, where they're made. Notice the sizes are all the same. Average weight, 2.8 kilograms per brick. Units per square metre. That's how many bricks you get in a cubic metre. Pack size, you get 228 bricks in a, uh, in a pallet when it comes. So the uncontrolled, the, the compressive strength exceeds 20 megapascals. So they're reasonably strong, exceeds 20. Cold water, it'll absorb 10% of its weight in water, or less than, but you want to store them carefully. Um, initial rates of absorption, won't, we don't need to go into these. Uh, this is durability. Some bricks aren't, aren't suitable for being outside because they're too soft or finished. So these are... It, Exposure, these are external grade. Um, the liability to efflorescence, nil to slight, and that will depend greatly on how you store them. Um, and the solar absorption rating, how much heat they're sucking. Well, obviously, the dark one, dark, 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 medium, and here's a light one. My, my house is built in quite light ones actually to reflect more heat for me. There are different varieties of bricks. And these are the classes as well. So you get unburnt bricks. They're the ones that are just made and laid out in the sun. Um, interesting little fact here. If you go to some English, uh, and probably probably European, I would go, uh, you go to some of their older brick-built manor houses and things like that, or, or, or farmsteads where the main buildings are built of brick, you will inevitably find there's a very large pond or small lake and that's where the fish are because they got fresh fish from those of the day that's actually where they dug out the clay to build the next door, you know, build the house on the site so they used to get the materials locally very sustainable uh, then we go to burnt bricks which is what we do and burnt bricks come in different classifications so the first class bricks which we're normally using uh, they've got a compressive strength Minimum 140 kilograms per centimetre squared. Always watch what they're measuring here. Second class bricks, a little bit weaker. Third class bricks, even weaker still. And fourth class bricks, they can be regular in shape. They can be dark in colour, but because they've been fire over fired maybe, they're stronger. Okay, and then there's an engineering brick which is even stronger than that. And there are special bricks in different shapes. Um, this here, I reckon you must visit this because I didn't want to just regurgitate. So if I click it, it's gone to the other screen. Here we go. This site is quite good. Just tells you the classification of the bricks. Goes through different methods, the costs of them. And here's, here's this. I've just got these headings and it tells you all about it here. Nice few pictures. Then it goes into special types of bricks. And you can go properties and a complete guide for bricks. Really good to go to this. A ball nose quite often used on corners of walls and on window seals. 
to, to get rid of that sharp corner that you want. And you see there's a lot of information on these, a lot of information. Uh, probably worth printing out and downloading. There you go. And I thought it easier to give you the link than to just, you know, regurgitate the information that's already there. There's your varieties. Then we're going to look at the water, I think. We're going to look at water next, because water's bad for bricks. Um, normally, the absorption rate that's is acceptable for a brick is somewhere between 12 and 20%. We prefer to be as low as possible, because the more water it absorbs, the more chance it's going to suffer frost damage where the water in the brick expands when it turns to ice and it cracks and blows blows the face of the brick off on the colder side or you get effluorescence or if it's damp for too long it encourages mould growth um, the high porosity which, which means you're going to high water absorption basically means there's less solid material in the brick there must be more fissures and gaps so the strength of the brick is lower so uh, a brick that absorbs a lot of water is obviously of less strength than one that doesn't. As I said, an engineering brick is almost impervious. Um, high absorption levels, sucking that water in, can actually relate to defects, so, as I mentioned, of frost action and efflorescence. Efflorescence here, this is efflorescence down here in this picture, and that's just the salt that's naturally in the brick and the mortar actually becomes suspended in the water and evaporates out and form and the salt is left behind on the surface when the water is evaporated away it's this it sounds slightly it can lead to, to decay and failure with the face of the brick uh, you normally get this on a new building and they have to brush it off um, if you've got higher absorption again these bricks that means the water is going to get deeper into the brick and it could end up causing dampness inside with all the knock-on effects, a little diagram of a solid wall here. So your water's on the on the pavement surface. There's no damp-proof course in this. It gets in, it sucks. Capillary action takes it up. Wick, they, they call it wick. Here. It's capillary. Oh, yeah, capillary action sucks it all the way out. Um, if you've got wooden things inside, this will rot. It will be damp. So, and this is where the effluence comes when it evaporates out and the faces crack off. Um, efflorescence, which is a question in the thing, um, it's due to the white or grey patches of salts. They are the salts from the bricks and the mortar depositing basically on the surface of the brick. The water evaporates, leaves the salt behind. Um, they're present in all bricks to start with because they're in the clay. Uh, if they're not fired really well, they've not been allowed to dry properly before fired, or your structure's got no damp proof course, or you've stored them incorrectly on site before you use them. Um, then the salts are going to be dissolved in the moisture and they evaporate. Um, one other thing I haven't mentioned here is when you get batches of bricks, you get your pallets of bricks, they, are, they can vary slightly. You may not get all your bricks from one firing. You may have bricks from three or four different firings, which could mean there's slight alteration, you know, slight variation between the mix and the temperature and the length of time, only minor, but it does make a very slight difference to the colour of the brick. So if you just use a pallet, build your first few courses, then open the next pallet and build your next few courses, you'll end up with a very stripy building. So what bricklayers will do is they'll open up several all at the same time and they will mix them. They'll take a brick from each pile and then mix them up and then it hides that variation. So always mix your bricks, always mix your batches up. Uh, thermal. Thermal, thermal, thermal. Bricks are actually really good because they've got a thermal mass. So they'll absorb heat during the day and they'll radiate it out at night. Um, if you're in a hot climate, it can't be so good because they'll just radiate it. Unless they, you want this, they'll actually radiate the heat in the night time to keep it a bit warmer, but it might already be hot. Uh, if it's colder outside, they'll radiate the heat outside. Remember, remember, heat always goes from hot and it tries to get to the colder area. So, outside hot, inside cool, it'll try and get in. Inside hot, outside cool, and in the night maybe, it'll try and get out. This is why we, we lose heat. 
So they've got a high thermal capacity, they've got a good thermal mass to them, um, so they can be used in part of the design of a wall. They contribute really well to the insulation and thermal performance of a wall. Um, but their, their R value, their, their thermal insulation value, the R value as we're talking about, and you'll see that in the um, Building Code of Australia stuff, isn't very good. So their, their performance comes from their thermal mass, not their insulation property. Um, a traditional solid wall have got a high thermal mass. They absorb the heat and radiate it in. Uh, but they can get damp, as we said earlier. And if it's very hot and then gets very cold, they can suffer from a lot of thermal movement creating cracks. This is why we have expansional movement joints in walls, if you'll see them as you go around. Uh, cavity walls. The cavity was originally to prevent moisture getting from the outside to the inside, but it also gave us a lovely place to put some insulation. So here's your cavity wall, inside, outside, and we shove insulation in it. Now there is a risk you could bridge the cavity if the work's not done properly and let the moisture in. Uh, these are solid masonry walls, so you can have metal ties, but traditionally you'd have a brick going the opposite way to tie them together. Uh, and this is a timber frame with a brick cladding and insulation on the inside. Um, the one thing I've just realised I haven't shown you is the different bonds of bricks. So I will email something through Teams, uh, message it to you in Teams after the lecture. I just realised I forgot that. Uh, fire. Okay, bricks, they've already been heated to a high temperature, so they are generally fire resistant under reasonable circumstances. Um, if a brick wall does foul during a fire, it's because, normally, because they've got excess thermal cracking, um, they've twisted and deformed because of that, um, or the heat's actually got all the way through to the far side of the wall, and maybe um, the wall's getting some of its lateral support from timber floor joists, and they've caught fire, and the wall just becomes a freestanding pile of bricks and falls over. Uh, but the material itself, the brick itself, is good. Um, here we've got different types of wall. This comes from here, and I'll show you this in a minute. Different types of wall here. Uh, that's, for the next thing, sound reduction. How, much, how many decibels they absorb. So if it's noisy outside, and you've got the cavity wall no end up, then inside, you'll only get, you would have lost 55 decibels. So if it's 100 outside, it'll be 45 inside. And this is the fire rating of these walls. So this is the fire resistance in minutes. So 60, 60, 60, we're not doing building code, but I can explain this during the tutorial if you want. But basically, that's got the least fire resistance. This has got the most. Now this all comes from here, and I recommend again that you go to this website. Okay, the Clay Brick and Pavia Institute, design in brickwork. So go for an introduction. Da, 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 da. This is a teaching package that we're allowed to use. So let's have a look at brickwork design, and then all this opens up. So modern, modern movement, designing bricks, opening archings, coatings, brick types, prefabricated bricks, good brickwork. What does it say about good brickwork? That's all it says there. Uh, designing brickwork. Where you've got where the colour in a building is actually in the structural elements, i.e. the colour hasn't been applied, it's called structural polychromy. Useless fact. And you can go to look at walls, and it tells you about load-bearing walls, non-load-bearing walls, lintels, reinforced brickwork, which is an interesting one. And there's a couple of different bonds there, but they're the most common bonds you're going to get. So read this one, very good. Uh, mortar and joints is useful, so you can see the different types of joint going on. I'll talk about this in the uh, tutorial a little bit. That's the expansion joints. Now, there's one there. Normally you hide it behind a rainwater pipe or something to stop little fingers digging at it. Um, there's some case studies here. 
the bibliography has got the references here. So this is really good, a good website for you. Again, I didn't want to just regurgitate this stuff. Just, if it's there and it's good, I'll send you to it. So go to this and print out what you want to for it. Okay, um, acoustics. Again, I'll go to that in a minute. So single leaf plaster, da da da, it gives you 55 as we saw earlier. Um, I've sent this to you. So you should all have a copy of this now. It all came through Teams. Um, and go if you go Brick website, it's, again, it's a really good website to have a little browsing. Uh, why choose Brick, Brick Profession, da, da 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 There's some good stuff in here. There's some good stuff. Very good for um, doing your assessments, really. Nice examples coming up, award winners. I mean, it's, it just gives Bricks a little bit more, you know. You, you get to understand them a bit more so that's actually a nice little website you can print a few bits off that if you want to helps you with the assignments that one does and then I, that, that's it really because I, I've forgotten the thing about the bonds which I will send you please visit those websites um, but I've got some examples for you here this is a Victorian or well, it might be a bit earlier than Victorian there's 33 types of specially shaped brick used in that. Um, and I would think there's some special soft red rubbers that have been carved on site as necessary. Okay, um, obviously as I'm telling you to reference everything, this comes from here and that's the website to go to. So I click it. I think you might have to type these in. I may not click for you. It takes you to the best brick architecture around the world. So, that's interesting. That's where I got that picture from. Inside a building. Look at these. Brick, I don't like that one very much. So, South Korea, that one is. Just to show the age. The British temples. And there's more here you can go through and have a look at. You can get some lovely things out of these. So, if you see the website, just copy and paste it into your browser and go ping. And you can see the detailing that's going on here. It's got arches and I mean it's it's so intricate, it's ridiculous. Example number two is a modern building. It's only oh, 2014 this was finished. This is um University of Sydney. It came from the memories of that blog. Um, famous architect, let's nip in to see him. Come on then, open up. The internet's being slow. Too many people stuck at home, I think. Where is it? Oh, I'm into flowers now. It's here somewhere. It's here somewhere. somewhere. Oh, I'll come back later on to it. But oh, what's this? Brown. You can find it. Have a look there. But this is brick. Lots of handmade bricks. Notice nothing's actually straight in this building. Lots of curves and funny angles. So it, was, it was meant to be designed to... To represent a crumpled paper bag that the architect saw. Look, all these. Every brick, every brick was individually, when they designed it, every brick had a number, every brick had a specific shape. So when you picked a brick up, it only had one place to go in this building. Okay, obviously it's cladding, it's not load bearing. This is a, I can't remember if it's reinforced concrete or steel frame building behind, but this is cladding brick. But look at it. It's wonderful, isn't it, really? Bizarre, but wonderful. Um, typical Victorian architecture. The diff see the different colours. These all these different colours. That's the polychromy I was talking about. That's what you call that polychromy. Uh, different bricks. These are different different types of stone work. Different types of stone. This is uh, St Pancras Station in London, I think. Um, when they first opened the railway, and it goes from London up up to the Midlands in Britain, as far as Manchester, I think. And all the stone and that bricks were all delivered from the Midlands and brought down to build the station. So everything this is built of comes from areas that they serve with their railway line. So... And then the last example here is a typical house. Taken, oh, a few years ago now, because this thing, this is, um, Bismarck Palm, is up here now. So, this is my house. Uh, I don't have that car anymore. I don't have that car anymore. Um, so here we go. I built the house. Um, but it's brick veneer. 
So that's a timber framed house with a light coloured brick veneer deliberately picked to reflect more light and reduce the heat gain going on. So there you go. So that's the end of that one there. Um, I might do one thing while you're looking here. Um, I would see if I could find the brick bonds thing because I do feel pretty bad that uh, I overlooked that there. So let me have a look. Let's have a look. Images. So if we have a look at this one here, these are pretty standard brickwork bonds. So that's just the they're just laid on each other and they overlap. That's how you would have built walls with Lego when you were a kid. Uh, common on American bond, you've got the the long way is called a stretcher, and then the ends of them is called a header. So they're all stretchers. Then you've got a row of stretchers, then headers, then a few rows of stretchers, then headers. Uh, Flemish, quite often you quite often called uh, garden wall bond. Is a very strong wall because you've got a stretcher header, especially if you've got a solid wall because those headers go through and tie it all together. Um, English bond, stack bond has got no strength whatsoever. Um, An English cross Dutch, there's, there's loads, of, loads of things to do for this, so just see if I can find a better one. Uh, got the same stuff, then you could try to identify. I'm never going to ask anyone to identify them, I might ask you to draw one. Um, this one. So the stretcher bond, uh, common bond with the headers, every sixth course, Flemish, common bond Flemish every sixth. Let's try and work out the difference. Uh, the garden wall one there, oh, I didn't call that garden wall, I tend to call those garden wall. Uh, English Dutch stack, soldier course, this is the soldier course on the top, often seen on top of a wall uh, and they tend to fall apart. Uh, so there's the bonds, so just type in brick bonds and you can find those. There's plenty of them going. Um, and we'll have a look at... Um, oh, I, can't, I haven't got time to do stonework for you, I don't think. So if you've got any questions on that, then jump straight onto Teams. Um, I'm just going to upload this, so it'll be about an hour or something. Oh, what is it now? 10 a.m. Wednesday, so it'll be up by lunchtime once it's been processed in Echo. Uh, if you've got any problems getting getting into it, let me know, and I'll also turn it into a PDF and upload the PDF, and I'll send I'll send those directly to everybody individually as well as just putting it in the Files tab in in uh, Teams and also putting it into Moodle. Um, I hope you're all getting on with Teams really well. Um, any problems, just contact me straight away. I'm only here to help out. Um, I'll see you all on Thursday when we'll actually talk about the bits you don't get and the bits I missed out. And uh, by the way, I've only seen one draft assignment so far. I thought I might have seen a couple more before now. But there we go. I think I might go and have a vodka. Oh, sorry, it's only 10 in the morning. Coffee. I'll see you on Thursday.